All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Brandon. My last name is Fetch. You can just call me Brandon. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about time management, as you can see. Uh, there's going to be a couple of uh, uh, participation sections available here, like the things where I'm asking for your input. Note that the response isn't required for your attendance to be counted or whatever, uh, but it's still nice to have a little bit of feedback. Um, uh, specifically, I'm going to be dissecting what's stopping us from making the most out of our time every day. And uh, that goes from procrastination to disorganization. Uh, let's dive in. I wanted to start off with procrastination because it's one of the uh, more common time management issues that students and people in general deal with. Notice that procrastination reading that definition, uh, isn't like other kinds of time management issues. When you're procrastinating, it's often not like you ha don't have enough time or whatever. Uh, more often, um, it's, a, it's a problem of motivation and avoidance. Not having enough time can exacerbate your procrastination, but it's not the root issue there. Since procrastination affects how you might manage your time in general, still irrelevant, uh, so let's address it. As a recovering procrastinator, I feel obligated to explain why we procrastinate. Uh, to do that, though, I'm going to have to say something that might sound a little insulting at first, which is uh, that we're all basically animals. I don't mean that we're not more than that, because we are more than just animals, of course, but uh, we have a lot of behavior that makes more sense if you take our rational thoughts out of the equation. To show you what I mean, I want you all to make a list of two or three things. You could write it on paper, or you can put it in chat if you wanted to, uh, of things that you procrastinate on. Just like any anything that you procrastinate on regularly, or maybe you're procrastinating on right now. You don't have to share these things, just make, make sure, making sure you have that list available is a good idea. Feel free to share them as well, though. There's a lot of common ones that I think people will relate to, so uh, uh, still helpful to put them in chat if you wanted to. I'll give you another 30 seconds or so to think of things that you procrastinate on. Note that you could write this in Word as well, like on Microsoft Word or a notepad or anything like that. All right, I hope you got a few. Uh, let's think about what uh, what I want to focus on is how those uh, how those things, doing those things, thinking about those tasks makes you feel. And by that, I mean not the task, not uh, completing the task, like finishing your homework might sound great, but starting your homework. How does starting those tasks make you feel, uh, thinking about starting them? And usually, at least for me, it's not good feelings, right? Like if I'm thinking about uh, starting something I'm procrastinating on, let's say uh, doing the dishes. If I'm thinking about doing the dishes, uh, I'm feeling dread. I'm like, I do not want to do the dishes. So, like, I, I really don't want to do it. And so uh, the, the feeling my, my brain is experiencing uh, is not a good one. And that's the problem. Uh, uh, even though we'd be better off emotionally and materially by completing that task now, uh, we could relax for the rest of the day. We might even have time to review it and do a better job. Even though the, those things are true, our motivations generally only really care about the fact that uh, the task makes us feel bad. So we don't want to do it. Our motivations are fueled by that, that, um, that feeling. Now, I don't think there's any any fixing motivations. Not not it's uh, not the base process of it relating to emotions. But what we can do is address those emotions. Uh, and let's talk about how we can do that. Let's talk about some strategy. Since I usually tutor math, I figured I'd approach this in the nerdiest way possible by graphing our bad feelings. 
notice that bad feelings here could mean uh, anxiety, could mean worry, uh, dread, could mean boredom, anything that affects you in a negative way. As you move from left to right on this graph, you progress through time. So it, the, uh, whatever your task is would be assigned on the left and it's due on the right. As you move up and down on the graph, you start, feeling, you start from feeling fine to feeling horrible about whatever it is. There are two lines and let's talk about both. Uh, the red line here describes, uh, the red line describes the bad feelings that are stopping you from starting the task, the things that are preventing you from starting it. It's the feelings that we were just talking about on the last slide. When you think about starting a task, how does that make you feel? It's probably the red line here. By that, I mean, it doesn't make you feel good. And that fact doesn't really change whether it's, uh, whether it's six weeks out or due tomorrow, that kind of thing. The green line, by contrast, are the bad feelings about completing the task late. Uh, that is, it's the consequences of not doing a good enough job or just not doing it at all. So for instance, if the assignment is six weeks out, you're not all that worried about, about uh, completing the task late. But if the assignment is due tomorrow, you're probably sweating. Like it, it's, you're probably not feeling good about it. Uh, I keep using classwork as an example for this. Like I say, like the assignment and things, but this really applies to all sorts of things. Uh, for instance, taxes, right? The taxes are due pretty soon. It's like in a month or so, I think. Uh, uh, so I'm somewhere around here, I think. <laughs> like I'm not feeling, I haven't, don't think I haven't completed my taxes yet, but I don't want to. So the red lines up here, um, I want to make sure that I complete it before I have to start it. <laughs> um, here's the problem. Completing my taxes, completing the assignment, doing the dishes, all of these things, they take time. Thank you, Silas. Uh, all these things take time. They take a certain time, which means you have to start not like a day before the assignment or three hours before the thing is due. You have to start sometime before that. So uh, in other words, you have to start somewhere before this point. However, here's the problem. Uh, you would probably start when the green line gets above the red line. In other words, when you're more worried about completing the assignment late uh, than you are about just actually starting it, how, however it makes you feel. So we're starting it too late. And that's a problem. We have to start it before this section because this is how long it takes, but we're starting it right here in the middle of that section. We've procrastinated too long. So how do we fix this? Well, we can try to move the lines around. We can do whatever we want with them, uh, but there's some simple operations we can do with this that will uh, translate pretty literally in this, like in the real world here. Uh, the, my favorite solution here is to move the red line straight down. So when we move the red line straight down, let's watch what happens. Notice that when we move the red line straight down, this point where they intersect, where the green line gets above uh, is way back here. It's before this section over here, which means we now have enough time to do a good job on this assignment. We have enough time to clean the dishes thoroughly. We have enough time to complete our taxes before the IRS comes to our door. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Moving that red line down is the same thing as having less apprehension about starting and completing our tasks. I like this solution a lot because it asks me to have fewer bad feelings and not more, which sounds like a nicer way to live. Let's figure out how we can do that. How can we move this red line down? In other words, how can we feel less bad about the things that we want to do? How do, how do we make them feel less intimidating, less uh, uh, worrisome or whatever, right? To lower that red line, we need to feel less of those things that prevent us from starting our tasks. Firstly, make sure you know what those things actually are. Ask yourself why you are uh, why you are procrastinating. We did a bit of this earlier, but you can do this for every task individually. Ask well, why am I not why am I procrastinating? What is what is so bad about this task that I'm not doing it right now? Once you know what that feeling is, try to uh, you can you can address it in a few different ways one common one that works for me at least uh, is to break the task up if you have to complete a big project for instance the fact that it's so big might make it intimidating so you can try to make it less intimidating 
instead of, a of instead of the task being complete presentation, just to pick a random example, uh, make it 10 tasks instead, one per slide. To speak metaphorically, when you approach the staircase, don't think of the whole thing, think of every step. This can really lower the, lower the barrier to start. Another, th another thing you can try to do is to appeal to that animal brain we mentioned earlier. Uh, when you complete a task or even just make a little progress, reward yourself with something you like. It'll probably feel silly. You'll, you'll feel like, okay, I did three, three questions on the homework. Now I'll eat a piece of candy like I'm a dog or something. But your brain doesn't think about that. It doesn't think how silly it feels. Your brain is like, ooh, a piece of candy. It's like, yay, I'll do that again. Um, and this is a training process. It'll take some time, but it's something that can really uh, sort of rewire your response to the things that you want to do. And note that this reward can vary a lot by people. If you're like me, you like sweets, candy works. Like I, I certainly love candy. Uh, but if you like uh, reading, for instance, you could read a, a few pages of your book. Or uh, if you like, oh, I don't know, uh, going on a walk, you could always do that. Whatever you like doing, really. The last piece of advice I want to give about feeling less bad about the things that you're procrastinating on uh, is to not criticize yourself too harshly. In the same vein as that last tip, your animal brain responds to punishment with avoidance. And that doesn't matter whether the punishment is coming from someone else or yourself. Avoidance, however, is our enemy here. We don't want avoidance. Avoidance is that's procrastination. So we want to uh, we want to not beat ourselves up, in other words. Um, and note that this has the benefit of also just not feeling as bad in the day to day. Uh, but it's also a, a strategy um, for not procrastinating. You can identify where you need to improve without making it like a really negative experience. All right. So we've dealt with procrastination. We know what to do about that, at least a general strategy. Um, what's next? Because the problem with time management isn't often just procrastination. Uh, often we're not using our time in the most optimal way in a few different manners. So let's talk about some other strategies we can approach to managing our time more effectively. I'd like to start off with uh, organizing our time. Uh, to avoid wasting it, we can organize our time to at least see how we're using it and make adjustments where possible. This will largely come in the context, at least here, uh, of a schedule. Here, you can see a daily planner, same sort of idea. In order to squeeze more time out of your day, however, you'll first need to know how your time is already being spent. This is step one. Figure out how you're already using your time. I'd recommend some sort of calendar app as that will allow us to make changes and find errors more easy, easily, uh, but working on paper definitely has its benefits too. In fact, why don't we actually start like right now? Why don't you start making a schedule right now, either on paper or a digital notepad of some kind? Write down something you do every day, like uh, something very re something you do that's really reliable. Maybe you wake up at 9 a.m. every day, or maybe you have dinner at 7 p.m. every day. And you don't have to put this in chat. In fact, uh, writing it down would be better here. Um, but uh, writing it down gives you a little head start on building that schedule. I'll give you about a minute to think of a, one or two things that you do every day. You can write that down on a piece of paper or uh, on a notepad of some kind.
if you have something that you do only on certain days of the week, that could also work, right? Like, let's say you have class at 4 p.m. on Thursdays. You could write that down. Yuchen, yeah, perfect. I like that. I study my citizenship test and to take care of my sons. Good, good. So you do that every day. Also think about when you do it as well. Again, you don't have to share those times or anything, but the the uh, part of building a schedule is knowing not only what you do during a day, but when you do it. That way you can shuffle it around. All right, so now we have a little bit of a head start into building our schedule. When you, uh, when you leave here today, when we're done with this presentation, you can bring that to uh, a calendar app, put that in, and then start. Now you have a head start. You have a good place to start for your schedule. Um, when making your full schedule, though, uh, you don't need to be too precise. Don't worry about being too precise. The goal is to just get a general idea of how you spend your time. If you're not, if you're not sure if you take 10 or 20 minutes to prepare dinner, don't worry about that level of detail at first. Just make it 20 minutes and take care of it later if you need to. You can add specifics as you use and modify your schedule. So just start off big. Additionally, the schedule is only for you, so there's no use in embellishing. If you spend two hours in bed looking at your phone, like I do sometimes, uh, put that on there. You can modify those more embarrassing times at a, later date, at a later date if you want or not. It's totally up to you, but you only have the power to do that, to modify your schedule, if you're true to your, if you're honest to yourself first. So uh, don't embellish anything. Also, I wouldn't leave any gaps, uh, even if you aren't doing anything in particular during those times. Put something like flex time or free time there. This allows you to see what time you have available should you need to change your schedule around. That way, if you need to move your schedule around, you see, oh, that's just free time. I can move my schedule into there. I can change things. All right, so we have a little bit of a schedule started. Um, now we can actually think about uh, changing it because I mentioned that we can change things later. Uh, how do we go about changing that? And one thing that we can do is prioritizing. And by that, I mean, we can pick and, ch and, pick and choose which uh, uh, things we want to do in what order uh, by how important or difficult uh, or immediate they are needed, that kind of thing. For each of your tasks, I would label your tasks so you know what can change and what can't, uh, or what is necessary and what's not necessary, what's immediate, what's not, what's for school, what's for work, that kind of thing. The more you label things, the more you might get an idea of what can change and what can't. Of course, all of these labels and all of these features are all, to me, all just for you, so I'm not trying to tell you what, what you need on your schedule necessarily. Consider adding a difficulty rating for your tasks. You're like, this is a really difficult task. That's a nine out of 10, something like that. Uh, that can help be helpful in information when you are reviewing your, your schedule later. You can use those labels to try to color code your schedule. Maybe you make all of your food activities uh, red, or maybe you make your tasks that can't be changed uh, green, for instance. Most calendar soft software allows you to change the color of events. So take advantage of that. Color coding might allow you to get a better grasp of how you can change your schedule or how you should change your schedule at a quick glance. You're like, I see a lot of blue. I'm doing a lot of homework this week. Maybe I need to change it or something. It's also a, a generally a good idea to complete your difficult and important tasks first. In addition to preventing procrastination, this can help you ensure that you have enough time to complete those tasks, as uh, the tasks that, the tasks that come later can necessarily be changed more easily, since they're less important and uh, less difficult. This, note, however, that this prioritization should never be used to eliminate the ways that you take care of yourself. Everyone needs time to relax in their own ways. So don't let a critical look at your schedule allow you to forget to take care of yourself. Having some time for yourself is important.
All right. One other note I wanted to make about building a schedule is uh, is one way that it's useful in a time management sense is that it allows us to limit our time. To explain what I mean by that, I'm going to sort of build a scenario. Imagine you are assigned an art project. You have to complete some sort of art thing for school or for uh, uh, for work, some sort of thing you have to you have some artistic liberties you can take. Um, and let's say it is due in three weeks. And and you you just by looking at it and uh, estimating how much time it'll take, you think it'll take, let's say, two hours in total to complete. However, um, when you build your schedule, you give yourself eight hours to complete it because you want to do a good job. Well, the problem with that is that now you've taken up six hours of doing other things. And you probably can do a good job in three hours or so, maybe. It'll take two hours minimum, but you can you can probably do it. Uh, you can probably make it uh, really good in that three hours. So therein lies the problem. When you humans, when we humans are assigned, uh, are uh, give ourselves a ton of time to do something, we generally like to just take the whole thing. We just take all the work. So uh, it's better off. You're better off trying to limit your time in order to make sure everything else can get extra time. The first step for this is to identify that minimum time I mentioned. Uh, so for instance, if I had a task on my calendar that was get groceries, um, I would say that takes at least 45 minutes, including the car rides. This can vary a lot between tasks and might need adjusted from your initial estimate. After you set your minimums, go about setting maximum times. This will prevent you from spending too much time on one particular task. Start off by adding a little bit to your minimum time, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and see if that gives you enough time to complete the task. The point in limiting your time is to ensure that you don't waste it, but that doesn't mean you can't be realistic. If you notice you need more time, extend it by a little bit. I like to use alarms. So uh, if I notice I'm spending too much time on something, I'll set a 15 minute alarm and say, I'm gonna work on this this much longer, that kind of thing. All right. The last thing about schedules, and it is the last thing, <laughs> won't stick on this too long, I promise, uh, that I want to touch on is keeping it updated. There's a lot of benefits from keeping your uh, schedule updated, which we'll talk about. Um, first of all, if you use your schedule frequently enough, if you keep updating it, uh, it, using it will become a habit, which is a really good thing. Once it's a habit, you don't have to put effort into trying to do it. It's just part of your routine. You'll just do it. While it's not the focus of today's discussion, the skill of building habits is a really important one. Uh, and there are plenty of techniques to help with that. Next, uh, I want to mention that updating your schedule doesn't just mean when you have like a big life event, like if you uh, change between school semesters or if you change jobs. While it does apply then, it also applies to the smaller stuff. If you start going out with your friends every Saturday night, let's say, uh, you can put that on there. Or if you start cleaning up your bathroom more quickly, like you bought a tool that makes you clean it faster, uh, you can shrink that time on your calendar. So update the little stuff as well. Keeping your uh, schedule updated, however, helps in more ways than just saving your time. Uh, it also helps you a lot in making new plans because you can check your schedule to get a pretty accurate idea of when you're available. You could use it to more accurately audit your behavior, like if you're changing your bed sheets often enough. You can check your schedule and be like, oh, I changed my bed sheets two weeks ago, so that's good, or however often you feel like changing it. <laughs> Those kinds of things. All right, so we've talked about schedules. Uh, we talked about uh, prioritizing and limiting and things like that. However, sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes you just need to do things more quickly. If you have seven things to do on Saturdays and you add them up and it takes 18 hours, it's probably too much. 
So you need to, and, and you, sometimes you'll just need to do those tasks faster. Let's talk about some strategies to do that. Often the things you can do to save time throughout your day actually take some time to complete. For instance, if you work on your computer, you might spend some time ensuring that other programs are closed, that your programs are up to date, uh, that you're moving to a good work environment, let's say. Um, spending this time in advance seems like you're wasting time, but really you're saving time in the long run, usually. Let's talk about some of these kinds of strategies. One of these things we've actually already talked about, it's scheduling. Spending the time scheduling your day takes time, but it can save you time in the long run. Since we've talked about that one, let's move on to the next. Another thing you can consider uh, before you start a task is gathering all the things you'll need. For instance, if you're planning to do homework, it might be a good idea to get all of your notes ready, let's say. Uh, you could get some, uh, get your textbook ready. It's a good thing to have, have available. If you're doing math homework, maybe make sure you have your calendar, your calculator available. Excuse me. Preparing that ahead of time will save you the frustration of scrambling. Excuse me, save you the frustration of scrambling to find resources when you're in the thick of working on homework. Sort of maintain your groove, that sort of thing. You could also make sure that your plan of approach is an efficient one. Sometimes a little bit of research into the different ways people do things can really speed up your workflow. For instance, if you are working on a specialized design program, uh, like 3D modeling, something like Blender, let's say, it may really benefit you to look into the hotkeys available, like the shortcuts. This can speed up your workflow a lot. So checking that ahead of time can help. In that vein, let's give everyone a head start. If you've learned anything recently that makes your work a lot faster, share it in the chat. Meaning like if you, uh, if you learned how to uh, do anything related to housework or schoolwork or work work that's been making your life easier by making some task faster, uh, share it in the chat, please. Uh, let's share the knowledge. Knowledge is a good thing. <laughs> I'll give you about a minute to think of something. I had a student share an, a really good one earlier today, which was... I, um, they mentioned that they started using dictation software for long form typing, like, like essays or something. So they would, uh, they can, they can, uh, say what they want to put on their essay to their computer and it'll just type it all for them and then they can go back and edit and that saved them a lot of time. I thought that was a really good idea. Welcome, welcome. Right now we are talking about tricks that you can do to speed up your work. So if you can think of anything that you've learned recently, Maria, that, that's uh, helped you speed up your workflow, then that would be a good time to put in chat. I think, I'm in, I, think I remember you from our last workshop, so, so welcome. <laughs> I'll give it another 20 seconds or so. Silas mentions, uh, yeah, it's a good idea. I do that too sometimes. Yeah, the dictation thing. I've definitely heard good things about it. Might try it myself. One thing that I did, I've been doing recently is uh, using Microsoft Word to type in nice looking math. Uh, so I've used that to sort of speed up um, how I get nice looking math. Because there's some other programs you can use, but uh, Word actually works really well for that. All right, so 
uh, let's talk about um, uh, one more thing about this, about spending time to save time, which is that there is a danger involved because it could turn into procrastination. Um, speaking from experience, if you're spending two hours preparing for a 20 minute homework, it may actually just be delaying. You may just be delaying doing your homework. You may be procrastinating instead. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule about this. Just try to think about how much time and effort you're actually saving by doing what you're doing. All right. There is one other thing that we can do to spend time to save time, which is to organize, as you can see here. Uh, uh, that is, um, by organizing our space, as I say here, uh, I don't mean just your workspace, like your desk, uh, but also anything that's related to your work, like uh, if you carry a bag to work or um, you carry a backpack to school or anything like that, um, anywhere your, your things may be stored. Let's talk about some of those. The first one I want to talk about is physical storage. And I think this is the most obvious. Uh, that is, where are you putting the things that you want to find? Spending time finding them is wasted time. So if you can, uh, if you can find things faster, that's better. You can begin by organizing where you put things, of course. When you, uh, you may want to separate your school materials from your work things, from your other life stuff. You may also want to separate your class materials from one another, like your math class and English class gets different parts of your backpack, let's say. Another good idea is to separate long-term and short-term storage. You might not want to study your completed homeworks until you get really close to the next test. Uh, so storing them separate from your homework that's due like this Thursday might be a good idea. Another thing that tends to get disorganized, at least for me, is digital space. That is where your files are on your computer, uh, your bookmarks, uh, passwords even. Try to regularly go through your computer, your phone, your tablet, or whatever you work on digitally to make sure your files are where you need to be, where they need to be, excuse me. You should be asking yourself, will I be able to find this when I need it? And if the answer is no, make sure you put it where you can find it. Make use of folders by organizing all the files you download. You download something, immediately put it somewhere. Rename it. Make sure you know what it is. You can create folders inside of folders to further organize things. So if you're doing your taxes, you could create a folder for 2022, and then inside that you can have uh, a folder for uh, W2, you know, like a whole bunch of a whole bunch of uh, uh, organization that helps you know where things should go. If you have lots of unorganized files, this can take some time to initially actually organize things, but it's probably worth it. Now, it's generally a good idea to use browser bookmarks to make sure you know, uh, make sure you can quickly access the websites you find useful. Um, but this becomes less useful if you have a thousand bookmarks and no way to find them. Like if you have a thousand bookmarks and you're like, where is the Wake Tech home website? And you're like scrolling through them. It's not very useful at that point. In that kind of case, uh, it's a good idea to use folders in your bookmarks as well. Notice that most browsers, you can create folders in your bookmarks and that allows you to organize them nicely. You could have a folder for work, a folder for school, a folder for, um, your uh, social events, whatever you need, right? Additionally, folders by default give bookmarks, or excuse me, browsers by default give uh, uh, bookmarks a name. They'll come up with a, up with a name automatically generated by the browser. However, most, uh, however, those names might not be very useful. So I would definitely rename all of your bookmarks when you make them. The last thing about digital space I wanted to talk about was passwords. There's lots of advice regarding password management that I can go over. Uh, uh, lots of advice, um, especially regarding like safety and accessing them, but I'll try to condense it down real quick. 
Um, first of all, make sure you store them in safe ways. The, the standards for that can differ depending on what institution, but there's some general advice like, of course, don't, don't put it anywhere anyone else could access it um, and don't ever uh, email it or type it to anyone else, that kind of thing. Um, if you're working for a company or attending a school, keeping your password safe is often a requirement by them and not just like a good idea for you. A password manager can make it really easy to safely store lots of incredibly secure passwords. So it, it definitely, definitely consider one of those. The last thing that you can try to organize, uh, at least on this list, of course, uh, is your actual workspace, like the, the place that you're doing your work. Keeping your workspace organized can help you avoid distractions. It can help you get what you need faster and it might help you get into a productive, excuse me, a productive mood. Ensuring that you have anything physical you might need with you, like loose leaf paper or a drawing tablet or headphones or anything like that, uh, can help. If you won't need something, put it somewhere else. It might just distract you. Another thing you can consider doing when you're attempting to speed up your activities, your tasks, uh, is to get some help from other people. Sometimes finding people to help you with your tasks can, whether that's directly or just providing advice, can really speed things up. However, there are some things to consider. Firstly, uh, many students and people in general are reluctant to get help because they like they don't need it, right? However, you're probably worse off if you wait until the help is necessary. Getting that help before that point can save you a lot of time and, en and energy. So one piece of advice that I'd, prov I'd provide is that you should ask for help before you think you need it. As a tutor, I can say that you, uh, you will likely benefit from getting academic help when you're not at your wit's end looking from looking at your notes for four hours straight. It's better if you're not that intellectually exhausted. So get some help before that point. Also, make sure you know what resources are available to you. Wig Tech offers lots of resources to help students. So spend a little bit of time to get familiar with the services that we offer. To name just a few is the Wake Tech ILC, which is actually where, uh, who's presenting all these presentations today. Uh, they offer tutoring in math, English, and study skills, as well as computers. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I personally tutor math usually. We offer drop-in tutoring as well as appointment tutoring, one-on-one uh, on well, one on one, as well as like a group workshop setting, uh, online as well as in person. So you should find be able to find something that fits your needs. There's also Wake Tech's uh, career services, which can help you get the job you're looking for uh, straight out of college or help you decide what that career might actually be in the first place. It is in the college's best interest to see you get the best job you can right out of graduation. So they will work hard to see that, you're get, that you get there. There's also our libraries and libraries in general, uh, which can be a great resource for getting any sort of media that you might need for class. Librarians are trained to help you find the kinds of resources, kinds of materials you might need, whether it's for a class project or like a, a personal curiosity. Uh, try talking to them. There are plenty of other resources that Wake Tech offers, so check online to see a more complete list. Keep in mind, however, when you're getting someone's help, with schoolwork that you have to stay in the bounds of academic honesty. I mean, we all know that you can't just pay someone to do your homework for you, of course. Uh, we know that, but there's plenty of uh, things short of that extreme that can still get you in some hot water. For instance, if you're taking a class and your friend already took last that your friend already took last semester 
asking them what the uh, what what is on the final um, might just amount to, to academic dishonesty. I could make a whole presentation on academic dishonesty itself. Uh, so uh, I won't go into too many details, but I'll say a safe thing to do is to ask your instructor before receiving any help with classwork. All right, the last piece of advice I wanted to talk about today is eliminating distractions. This is something you can prepare every time you begin to work on something. There's a few ways we can take this. Firstly, though, I want to clarify that what one, what one person finds distracting can be appropriately stimulating for someone else. If you're the kind of person that needs to listen to music to do homework, let's say, I'm not trying to tell you that you're wrong. I just wanted to offer some general advice that you can pick and choose from. In that vein, I wanted to ask, what distracts you? What do you find yourself getting distracted by when you're trying to work, whether that's on homework or uh, or work, work, or even like I mentioned earlier, like like uh, 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 cleaning your house or anything like that? What what's distracting you? I'll give you a minute to respond in the chat. Other people talking about interesting things. Yeah, for sure. Right. Uh, if there's if there's other people around me talking, it's it's hard to work. I get that. There's one common one that I can attest to myself, which is my phone, right? Uh, I mean, we all know this. We, we hear it a lot that, you know, your phone can distract you or whatever. Um, so I won't harp on about it or anything, but uh, it is one that works for me as well, uh, is, or rather affects me, is that sometimes I'll be looking at my phone and I shouldn't be. So putting it away is a good idea for me. Linda says everything. Yep. Uh, yeah, I understand that. I'm here to What am I doing? Yeah. Okay. Um, I like the. I like you mentioned the, when you mentioned the direct interruptions, right? So if I'm working on a present on this presentation, for instance, and someone if someone comes up to me, if someone were to come up with me, come up to me and say, "Hey, do you know where uh, where the remote is?" or something like that, I'll suddenly be like, "Yeah, it's." next to the couch downstairs or something, right? And then I have a hard time getting back to it. I have a hard time getting back to my work. So yeah, those, those interruptions can really, uh, really be distracting. And phone calls, yep. Mm -hmm. Receiving messages, yep, yep. I'll sometimes get a text and that's what lights up my phone. That's where I'm at it <laughs> for sure. All right. I really like all the input there. Um, let's uh, uh, let's let's categorize all these distractions. We have a lot of distractions, but let's let's categorize them so we can know what to consider when we're beginning work, what sort of distractions we have to eliminate. Um, the first category I want to talk about is the distractions that exist in your in the physical space around you. Uh, what's the dis like uh, when you sit down to work, the desk in front of you, what's distracting you? And we talked a little bit about this earlier. If you don't need something, it could just distract you. You should put it somewhere else. 
but it also counts in accounts. It also uh, means people around you. Like, uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, if you have uh, people coming up to you and saying things like, where's the remote or uh, uh, anything like that, really. Um, one common one for me is snacks. Like I like snacking, but it does hurt my workflow a little bit. So uh, things can, lots of things can distract you in your physical space. You can also try to remove distractions from your digital space. This is one of the benefits of keeping your files clean, like we discussed earlier. You will probably get your uh, get less distracted looking for uh, the files you want if you can find them easily. If you spend uh, five minutes trying to find that, uh, trying to find a homework that you downloaded, and uh, you run into pictures of your mom and uh, uh, a, a love letter from high school, it's really easy to get distracted by those things. So uh, it benefits benefits you in that way to have your files really organized. You may also benefit from closing all other programs on your computer or turning off notifications on your apps on your phone. Note that many operating systems and browsers have focus modes or even the option to create another profile with fewer capabilities. Most phones have do not disturb mode if you still need the phone next to you but don't want it to distract you. The last category of distraction I wanted to talk about is mental distractions, by which I mean uh, distractions that aren't around you physically and aren't around you digitally, but are kind of just in your head. And that's not to say that those things aren't worth considering. That's why they're here, right? Um, but they, they are a different sort of deal. This can come in the form of uh, relationship issues, like if you're really concerned about a relationship issue you're having, uh, it could be depression even. Uh, it can be pretty serious stuff. So I want to be clear that these kinds of distractions, the issues uh, with, with them distracting you from your maximum productivity or whatever, might not be the most important thing about them, but it's still worth considering how they distract you. Therefore, even just for the productivity's sake, it may be a good idea to consider what sort of options you might have, what sort of resources you have available to help you with those, those issues. Anything that's getting you to think, anything that's getting you to think about it instead of your schoolwork or your work work or anything like that. All right, that's about all the, all the uh, advice I have for time management for today. Um, and I wanted to thank you all for coming. Uh, note that this presentation was by Wake Tech ILC, which like I mentioned earlier, uh, tutors things like math, English, study skills, and computers. Uh, please do make an appointment with us. Um, we'd like to help with all sorts of stuff. Um, I want to also make you uh, give you a link to the final closing keynote for this conference. I'm going to go ahead and link that directly in the chat. It's on adaptability. Sounds interesting. <laughs> uh, if you'd like to watch that one, you can use that link right there. Uh, it may also be in your calendar. There's all sorts of ways of accessing these calls. Um, so however you can get there, you can use that link. Um, otherwise, thank you for coming, and I hope that uh, some of this information was useful to you. I hope you have a nice day.